For the second time this month, residents in Bellport's Maplewood Landings are meeting with environmental representatives. They want to find out if their water is polluted, and if it is, why? They met two weeks ago, but left with more questions than answers. Our Roma Tori is standing by now in Maplewood Landings with the very latest. Roma? Right, Scott and Melba, perhaps the most notable part of that meeting two weeks ago is that the EPA failed to show up. And that was the agency the other environmental officials said was most responsible for resolving the problem. So now the residents are left with water they're afraid to drink and really no clear direction as to how and when their water will ever be cleaned up. We're going to hear from a resident in just about a minute. But first, a brief history of the problem. From above ground, Maplewood Landings in Bellport looks as normal and clean as a neighborhood can be. But underground, residents fear the normalcy ends. Many residents complain the water from nearby Mott's Creek and other sources is badly contaminated. People who have their own wells are contaminated wells. Their wells are contaminated. Uh, how many people are aware that they're contaminated in that area? We're not sure at this time. And in fact, a number of families haven't touched their tap water for more than two years. Many individuals have gotten sick since moving here, and they blame their medical problems ranging from tumors and warts to growth and hormonal disorders on the water. They also say they can trace the source of their problem to this old laundry site located above the development. They claim the owner dumped toxic cleaning chemicals illegally here for years. And since the laundry's closing 10 years ago, they say no one, neither the EPA, the DEC, the health department, or the owner, Gardner Hulse, has done a thing to clean it up. Now, joining me now is the community leader you just heard from in that report, Penny Scherf. Penny, you were at the meeting two weeks ago. You heard lots of talk, but are you seeing any responsible action? Not at all. As you saw at the first meeting, it became a football game. They were passing the issue from one department to another. And realizing that the EPA has our answers, we're hoping that the EPA will show up again tonight because we're angry, we're mad, and we want to know what are they hiding? What can't they tell us in front of us? What happens if they don't show up? We're, we're going to uh, maybe walk, you know, walk into their office and find out what, you know, we have answers, we have questions, they have the answers, and we don't know where else to go. Okay. Thanks, Penny Scherf. Uh, we were, are going to have the answer, hopefully, uh, to, as to whether or not the EPA shows up at the meeting. We will have that for you tonight on the nighttime edition on News 12 at uh, about 10 o'clock. That's it from here in Bellport. Let's go back to the studio. All right, Roma, find out then. Well, despite the possible problems in the Bellport area, some experts say the quality of Long Island's drinking water is actually very good. The water authorities got together today at Hofstra University to address some of the public's concerns. Our uh, Rosemary Gomez was there. Dursban, which some studies show may cause birth defects in the offspring of laboratory animals. The Burks say the product should have carried a warning label telling pregnant women not to use it. Dow Chemical says that the spray has been on the market for 20 years with no adverse effects. Two of the Burks' children were born blind and brain damaged. Doctors say the cause was not genetic. Residents in the Maplewood Landings community of Bellport met for the second time with environmental officials to find out what's wrong with their water. And for the second time, the lead agency responsible for investigating the possible hazardous site failed to show up. But as News 12's Romatory reports, the news wasn't entirely disappointing. Where's the EPA? Certainly not in Bellport Monday night. After representatives from the agency failed to show up at the last community meeting here two weeks ago, residents were fuming. They weren't at the first meeting. They're not here tonight. And if anyone knows a substantial amount about the problem, about this whole issue, they're not here tonight. The federal agency conducted preliminary tests of the Bellport laundry site eight months ago. And despite spotting a potential for hazardous water contamination, it failed to draw definite conclusions about the seriousness of the problem. Until it does, none of the other environmental agencies represented here, including the DEC, the Health Department, and the Water Authority, can do anything to help. Kind of in a limbo land where, because EPA was there, DEC made the decision that there's no point in having two people trampling over each other on the same site. Well, let's wait till they're done, then we get involved if we have to. But a representative from Senator Cesar Trunzo's office did announce the EPA will be in Bellport Tuesday afternoon for a site inspection. Good news for some, but considering the agency's track record, it prompted at least one frustrated resident to call this a case of Monday night political football. Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. The EPA says it will review the site again tomorrow afternoon and then determine whether to place it on its priorities list. 
If the EPA drops the project from of a loophole they approve for themselves. We doubt that campaign contributors, voters, or the founding fathers would approve of members of Congress keeping campaign funds for themselves. Most congressional incumbents standing for re-election would probably prefer not to comment. But Cablevision thinks Congressman Lent and Downey should make a commitment to their constituents on how they will use unspent campaign funds. And they should do it now, before another campaign donation is taken by them or they are returned to office. The preceding editorial represents the views of Cablevision. We'd like to hear your opinion. Write to Cablevision Editorial, P.O. Box A, Woodbury, New York, 11797. If you have the guts to study anatomy, chemistry, and psychology, call 1-800-962-NURSE. If caring were enough, anyone could be a nurse. Hometown news from all over Long Island. News 12, Long Island. From Montauk in the east, Great Neck in the West. News about Long Island for the people of Long Island. 24 hours every day. This is News 12, Long Island. And now, the night edition. It's every parent's nightmare. Eight-month-old Nigel Montgomery Bostic was supposed to come home from the hospital today. Instead, his parents are planning his funeral. News 12's Roma Torrey has more. Roma. The Coram baby was taken to Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx last month for a routine procedure. Yesterday, he died, and no one knows why. I don't have a baby anymore. I don't have a baby. I don't have a baby anymore. Teresa and George Bostick's only child together, eight-and-a-half-month-old Nigel Montgomery, suffocated to death in his hospital room. It happened just as the hospital was preparing to release the baby to go home. Back in September, Nigel was taken to Stony Brook Hospital and diagnosed with croup. He was sent home four days later, but his parents say his condition failed to improve. They were referred by their pediatrician to Dr. Robert Rubin at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. He's considered one of the best in the country. Rubin operated to enlarge the child's windpipe and later inserted a trach tube in the baby's throat. It was all considered routine, but then Monday evening, the hospital called. He said, uh, are you Mr. Bostic? And I said, yes. He said, we came, we found your baby in his, in his bed with his trach out, and he was turning blue, and we're working on it now, now we give him oxygen. He's very, very sick. If you can come down, if you can come down, come down. Both parents say the tube was fastened tightly to the baby's throat, and there was no way the child could have loosened the tube himself. His drink was out. He was blue. They found him in the bed and he was blue with his drink out. And then he would he... never let you touch his drink. He'd fight your hands. So somebody had to go in there. I don't know. I don't like to accuse, but it's too obvious that something's wrong. Their pediatrician and Dr. Rubin apparently agreed. Doctor? I spoke okay. to Dr. Rubin several times today. And uh, I asked him point blank, could the baby have done this? And it was Dr. Rubin's opinion that the baby could not have pulled the trach out of it himself. Now, there are two separate investigations uh, ongoing right now, one uh, an inquiry that the hospital is conducting and another one by the police. And the Bostic uh, family says they are waiting to find out the results of these investigations before they decide on their next step. Colleen. Okay. Thanks, Roma. Well, America's most widely used asthma drug is being blamed for a number of medical complications and deaths. And the Association of Trial Lawyers of America wants a ban on non-prescription sales. Oh, it's definitely creepy. Dude's body was found. In Long Beach, I'm Carolyn Gussoff reporting. Let's go back now to the studio. All right, Carolyn Gussoff, thank you very much. And Carolyn will remain in Long Beach today, and we will have more coming your way at 5. In the Bronx, tragedy for a quorum family. News 12's Roma Torrey tells us why, rather than celebrating a homecoming, the Bostic family is planning a funeral. I don't have a baby anymore. I don't have a baby. I don't have a baby anymore. Teresa and George Bostick's only child together, eight-and-a-half-month-old Nigel Montgomery, suffocated to death in his hospital room. It happened just as the hospital was preparing to release the baby to go home. Back in September, Nigel was taken to Stony Brook Hospital and diagnosed with croup. He was sent home four days later, but his parents say his condition failed to improve. 
They were referred by their pediatrician to Dr. Robert Rubin at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. He's considered one of the best in the country. Rubin operated to enlarge the child's windpipe and later inserted a trach tube in the baby's throat. It was all considered routine. He said, it's fine. He said, it's fine as long as the trach stays in. But if the trach comes out, it is a possibility of asphyxiation. <laughs> but then Monday evening, the hospital called. He said, uh, are you Mr. Bostic? And I said, yes. He said, we came, we found your baby in his, in his bed with his trach out, and he was turning blue, and we're working on it now, now we give him oxygen. He's very, very sick. If you can come down, if you can come down, come down. Both parents say the tube was fastened tightly to the baby's throat, and there was no way the child could have loosened the tube himself. His drink was out. He was blue. They found him in the bed, and he was blue with his drink out. And then he would he... never let you touch his drink. He'd fight your hands. So somebody had to go in there. I don't know. I don't like to accuse, but it's too obvious that something's wrong. Their pediatrician and Dr. Rubin apparently agreed. I spoke okay. to Dr. Rubin several times today. And uh, I asked him point blank, could the baby have done this? And it was Dr. Rubin's opinion that the baby could not have pulled the trach out it himself. The Vostics say they're awaiting the results of two separate investigations, one by the hospital, the other from the police. They say they'll decide then whether or not to take any legal action. Meanwhile, little Nigel Bostic, a baby his parents say was so full of life, will be buried in Medford. I'm Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. Police are investigating a shooting that seriously injured a Deer Park man. 28-year-old Henry Perez was walking up the steps to his house at 61 Suburban Avenue last night when he heard shots and glass breaking. Perez, who was returning home from his job in Manhattan, was then shot three times in the upper body. He was taken to Good Samaritan Hospital. And the parents of a quorum baby are grieving, and police and hospital officials are trying to figure out how the couple's baby died. As we told you yesterday, eight-month-old Nigel Bostic was found in his Montefiore hospital room with his heart monitor disconnected and his breathing tube removed. Montefiore Hospital held a news conference in the Bronx today. Romatori has more. Just what or who killed eight-and-a-half-month-old Nigel Bostic? The quorum baby was pronounced dead Monday afternoon at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx, just a day before he was supposed to have been going home. The child was brought to the hospital six weeks ago, suffering with a breathing disorder. His doctor, Robert Rubin, inserted a tracheostomy tube in the child's throat, and according to his parents, the tube was keeping the baby alive. He gave me a letter that says he's fine as long as the trach stays right. He gave him a letter, and he said, he said, well, he said it's fine. He said, it's fine as long as the trach stays in. But if the trach comes out, it is a possibility of asphyxiation. Nigel Bostic was discovered by a nurse with his tracheostomy tube pulled out. The string that connected the tube to his throat was apparently untied. And despite the fact that doctors tell us there's no way the tube could have been pulled out by the child himself, the hospital tells us there was no reason to call the police. At the time of the death, there was no indication of any problem that would require notification of the police. You say no problem though that's why you didn't notify the police didn't that seem suspicious to you that the tube was missing the, 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 and, and that the heart monitors were turned off at the time the medical personnel involved did not believe that there was anything uh, in here that was involving perhaps a police uh, notification well, the hospital spokesman claims it was possible for the baby to remove the tube from his own throat but a Holbrook pediatrician who treated the child said it would have been nearly impossible I spoke to dr. Rubin several times today and uh, I asked him point blank, could the baby have done this? And it was Dr. Rubin's opinion that the baby could not have pulled the trach out of it himself. So who pulled the tube and disconnected the heart monitor? The hospital says all doctors and nurses are being interviewed, and they're reviewing security procedures. But if it wasn't hospital staff or the baby himself, perhaps a stranger off the street. The hospital has increased security since the incident, and they say their investigation isn't ruling out any possibilities. I'm Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. 28-year-old Thomas Ryan has been sentenced to 25 years to life in prison for the 1979 murder of 13-year-old John Pius. Ryan is... We start getting very close to, uh... Now to the Bronx, police up there say that they have solved the case of a quorum baby who died last week in his Montefiore hospital room. 
But the news hasn't eased the parents' anguish. Uh, Roma Torrey is here with more. Roma? Right, Scott and Melba. All along, this has been an incredible, heartbreaking story, and now it seems to be ending no less incredibly. It started as a story about a mysterious death at a hospital renowned for its pediatric care. Well, tonight, doctors are saying eight-and-a-half-month-old Nigel Bostic died of natural causes. But the baby's grieving parents say the real cause of death was neglect and possible misconduct. After a week and a half of torment, wondering how and why their child died, George and Teresa Bostic heard the news today, and they say it was horrifying. The medical examiner's office determined the baby died of a viral heart infection and not asphyxiation, as the parents originally believed. It was a disease, the parents say, they were never told about. Were you aware that your son had any no, kind of heart problem? Nothing like this. If he had all these operations, why didn't the doctor know this, that he had a heart problem? Why didn't the doctor let us know that he had a heart problem? You know? What, did the doctors know that he had a heart problem? I, I don't know. I haven't talked to the doctor. I, we haven't talked to the hospital. We only talked to the detectives. And but perhaps even worse, they say. Police have informed them a nurse had broken down after being questioned by police overnight. She admitted to having found the baby slumped in his walker, not breathing. And she allegedly panicked, took the breathing tube out, placed the baby in his bed, and walked out of the hospital. He was found dead in his bed about an hour later. He could have been alive when she took him and put him in the bed and took his trach out. He could have been alive then. He could have just stopped breathing for just two minutes. She didn't give him a chance to do anything. She didn't give him a chance to call a code blue like they're normally supposed to do, like something like this. They didn't do anything. And for this, we're out of a baby, and this is in fans. And the DA's office said they're not pressing any charges because they didn't cause the baby to have a heart infection. She just didn't do anything when she found him unconscious in the walker. But with no arrest and no charges pressed against the nurse, George and Teresa Bostic are forced to question a system that is supposed to be in the business of saving lives. It shows that anybody doing anything, any kind of job, professional or non-professional, can do whatever they want to do and just walk away just like they did it and nothing's going to happen to them. But we're the one who gets to suffer because we don't have a child anymore. Now, the medical examiner says the baby was, uh, little Nigel, was probably dead when the nurse originally found him, and that is why they are not pressing charges against her. That also explains, though, why the medical or why the district attorney has uh, failed to press any charges. That's also why they're not releasing the nurse's name at this time. And uh, one only wonders what the parents are going to do next. What are they going to do next? Uh, well, I asked them if they're planning to file any legal action, and they said they're just stunned by this news, and uh, they're considering uh, hiring a lawyer. But, but again, uh, Roma, the medical examiner says that the baby died before the tubing was removed. The medical examiner says the baby was most likely dead when that nurse found him in the walker. But the nurse uh, claims and told the police that all she, uh, when she discovered the baby, he was just not breathing, his uh, chest was not, was not pumping and therefore she believed there was something wrong. She didn't say whether or not he was alive or dead. But she didn't report this to anyone? She just left her post? She, she went panicked. home? That's all, that's all uh, the police could tell us. She panicked. Strange. All right. Thank you, Roma. When we come back, we'll have more for you on Daryl Strawberries, Split with Shay. Bob Wolf has details on that and the rest of the sports. Suspended, but his parents still say something is wrong, and they've hired a lawyer to consider filing a lawsuit. Roma Tori reports. Nigel Bostic died of myocarditis, a viral infection of the heart which is capable of causing sudden and unexpected death. Just what happened to little Nigel Bostic on the afternoon of October 30th in Montefiore Hospital's pediatric ward? During that time period, he was active. He was, seemed to appear to be doing well. He was laughing, he was playing, and he was doing fine. But then something went wrong. A nurse found the baby slumped over in his walker in the nurse's station. According to police, she didn't know if the baby was alive or dead, but she panicked, pulled out his breathing tube, and walked out of the hospital. He was found about an hour later. His skin had turned blue, and he was dead. Is negligence as far as hiring people that they know that aren't capable of taking care of children? There's no indication of any negligence in this care. I think the problem is that despite the fact that this nurse was trained and demonstrated confidence in how to um, call a resuscitation code, she did not do so. And you have no explanation as to why she didn't? No, I do not. 
The nurse's name isn't being released because the district attorney isn't filing criminal charges. We do know she's from Jamaica and, according to the hospital, had an unblemished record since starting in August of this year. So why did she panic this time? I can only imagine that the nurse uh, acted inappropriately in the, in the heat of the moment. She complained about uh, being here and racism and um, other kind of problems and she was worried about her family at, back in uh, Jamaica and uh, she was by herself here and uh, she was scared and she didn't know. But to me, that's no excuse. How could it just be just one nurse to see some slumped over in a walker and just one nurse is going to pick him up? You know, they, they haven't accounted for that either. And why, the parents want to know, didn't anyone detect heart problems in their child during his six weeks in the hospital? According to one doctor, myocarditis can be that the sudden. Hand, there can be absolutely no clinical manifestations of the disease, and the first presentation can be sudden death. As for the Bostics, who've just now hired an attorney, they say this is all a nightmare for them, one they fear they'll be living forever. I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. The Bostick's attorney is David Breitbart of Manhattan, and he told Roma Torrey he believes that something smells in this case, and there is a strong possibility that he will pursue litigation. If you're planning to park your car in the village of New Hyde Park, you better keep an eye on the clock. The Hundreds of movies are being made on Long Island these days. The latest to be shot here is already an award winner. The director is Bonnie Palaf. She has won the first director's grant from the Maine International Film and Television Workshop. It's low budget, but as entertainment editor Roma Torrey reports now, that didn't stop the stars from coming out. Long Island is known for many things. Some good, some not so good. But insiders say it is fast becoming the Hollywood of the East Coast. Action! Now the latest project, a short film called Walking the Dog. No, not that kind of dog, this kind of dog, as in Yo-Yo Trick. It stars Francis Sternhagen and Lee Phoenix, River's little brother. And speaking of nature, it is Long Island's natural setting that brought this crew all the way out to Cold Spring Harbor. The location really lends itself to giving us the beautiful vistas that we need, as well as the cooperation from the people that live here. We've just found amazing help. But this isn't exactly your ordinary film. Oh, the stars are here, all right. That's Nora Dunn of Saturday Night Live fame and Victor Garber, the Broadway actor. He was, he was walking down the street this morning, and I recognized him as an old, out-of-work actor. And I said, oh, the clothes and I fit. Said, hey, come on, put him come in those down. clothes. And you took pity, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And all the equipment is state-of-the-art. But in this project, no one is getting paid. No one is getting a penny on this movie. How are you able to uh, induce them to work for nothing? Ask my producer. <laughs> he was the one that was able to do all of that. It's a secret. It's a secret. I don't know. I very often decide to do something quite whimsically. I just decide, oh, why not? We're here because of Bonnie Palef and her film and helping out on her project. That's great dedication, I would say. We get to keep the clothes. And the lunch is good. <laughs> They may tell you they're doing it to work with the best in the business, such as cinematographer Ernest Day, who shot A Passage to India. Or they might say it's the whimsical script that attracted them. But we know the real reason. It's the chance to work on Long Island. One of the world's best-kept secrets is leaking out. Yep, Long Island is known for a lot of things. I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. News 12's Bring a Friend to Lunch program continues as two more island schools do their best to help the home rather than traveling into New York City. So tonight we asked how Long Islanders rate the area's leisure activities. The results come from a News 12 poll conducted by Dr. Elaine Sherman of the Hofstra School of Business. Roma Torrey has the results. to the performing arts, many Long Islanders are singing the praises of the local arts scene. And while polls tell us the majority of Long Islanders are traveling less into Manhattan for leisure activities, many say there's plenty in their own backyard to compete with the Big Apple. Of the roughly 400 people surveyed, 82% responded favorably, with 44% saying the performing arts have gotten better over the last three years, and 38% said the performing arts have stayed the same. Only 2% said the arts have gotten worse. I think it's gotten better. I mean, with the Tillis Center and, um, and the uh, Arboretum, the shows that they've had at the Arboretum, I think it's gotten a lot better in the last five years. And Long Islanders seem fairly happy with their parks and outdoor recreational facilities. 
29% said the parks have improved in the last three years, 48% said they've remained the same, while 17% responded they've gotten worse. I like them very much, and uh, we make use of them periodically a lot in the summertime. And while many Long Islanders seem easygoing about what they pay to see and how they play, they say they're most critical about the food they put into their stomachs. Long Island restaurants fared pretty well in this survey, though. 82% said the food is better or at least the same as they were three years ago, while just about 12% felt the quality of our restaurants had gone down. Some of the most demanding food critics we found right here at News 12. Definitely worse. I think food quality has gone down, prices have gone up, portions are a lot smaller these days. You really don't get enough what you're paying for. I mean, three years ago I felt that I could walk into a restaurant and come out and feeling a little satisfied. Not today. Most of them, uh, especially in this area, Syosa Woodbury, seem to be as good as uh, many in New York. Mm -hmm. As good as your home cooking? Well, not quite. But. Bon Appetit. I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. Uh, honest Gene, the poll has an error factor of plus or minus five percentage points. The reason I'm going that far, right? Well, while we're asking questions, how about health care? What will it be like in the year 2000? And who's going to pay for it? Those were two of the questions raised in a meeting of... Okay. White Way. They're called OK and Buddy, the Buddy Holly story. Entertainment editor Roma Torrey has a review has two new splashy musicals, Buddy, the story of Buddy Holly, and OK, a remake of the 1920s Gershwin show. And while musicals may be the foundation of Broadway, these shows don't hold much weight. Still, what they lack in substance, they more than make up for in slick entertainment. <laughs> is quite a bit more than just okay. As revivals go, this one has lots of life and enthusiasm. It's a paper-thin premise about bootleggers hiding their hooch in the basement of a millionaire during Prohibition days. But you can pretty much forget the story and concentrate on the singing and dancing, which is mighty terrific. Best of all is Merrick's own Greg Burge, a dancer with the grace of Fred Astaire and the athleticism of Gene Kelly. Then there's the two leads, Brian Mitchell, a rather bland actor, who more than makes up for it with a magnificent singing voice, and Angela Teak, who gets to sing the show's best melody. Always be good. is another high-voltage musical. It traces the short but sweet life of rock and roller Buddy Holly. The music is the best part of the show, and the story you may find just gets in the way. It's not that Buddy Holly's life is uninteresting, it's just that each scene has as much depth as a two-minute music video. And they whiz by so fast you get the feeling the producers didn't want to give you the time to notice the bad writing. Still, if you like Holly's music, Peggy Sue, oh boy, that'll be the day. Seeing this show could very well make your day. as amazing as Holly, and he's got all the right sounds, hiccups, yodels, and all. It's not a great show by any standard, but so loud, fast, and boisterous, you won't even notice. Holly died tragically in a plane crash in 1959. You feel his loss all the more when you consider how much his own input could have improved this show. I'm Roma Torrey, and that's a wrap. And that's a wrap for us, too. I'm Don Crawford. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Rosemary Gomez. There's more news ahead, so stay with us. I think being prepared is really the number one thing we can do as doctors. The VA's director of in Northport, Susan Jellick, News 12, Long Island. Susan says next week a similar training program will take place in Maryland for VA hospitals in the South, and the following week in Indianapolis, mental health experts will discuss soldiers with traumatic stress problems. Well, Scott, right now there are about 230,000 U.S. troops in the Gulf area with thousands more slated to go to Saudi Arabia. News 12 wanted to know, what about recruiting patterns? Have they been affected at all by Operation Desert Shield? Uh, Roma Torrey standing by now at Marine Headquarters in Garden City with some answers. Roma? Right, Scott and Melba, we spoke with three branches of the military, the Army, the Navy, and the Marines. And surprise or no surprise, uh, none of them could tell us if there were any significant changes in the numbers of enlistees uh, since August. And whether or not Operation Desert Shield has anything to do with that, 
They had no answer. Are you employed now? Your age? There is activity in this Navy yeah, recruiting nice office, but not any more than last year. Navy officials say, if anything, recruitment has dropped slightly, but they attribute that to increased standards. One of our goals wasn't made. People immediately, of course, will say, well, that must be because of Operation Desert Shield. No one wants to go, but there's, there's no reason to believe that. We've had as many people come in the office and say, I want to go, as we have walk into the offices and say, I don't want to go, or stay away from the offices, or perhaps people who have been talking to a recruiter and have changed their mind. And over at the Marines, they're still the few, the proud, but no more, no less these days, despite Operation Desert Shield. We haven't noticed a change in recruiting. Our mission has uh, remained pretty much the same. But what we have noticed is that there's been an increase of former Marines who are interested in coming back into the Marine Corps. This young man, an 18-year-old, signed up today, but he said he would have done it no matter what was happening overseas. You signed up today? Yes, I did. Why? Well, it's in my family, and uh, I'd like to defend my country if there's a war. Does this have anything to do with Operation Desert Shield? A little, yeah, but my older brother is, is a captain in the Marine Corps now, and my father was in the Marine Corps, so I'd like to carry out the tradition of my family. The Marine recruiters don't see this as a mission to supply troops for Desert Shield. For them and other military branches, it is still business as usual. Now, there has been talk of lowering standards to encourage more young men and women to join up in the armed forces, but all three branches tell me they do have enough people to serve, at least for now. And, of course, the alternative to recruitment is the draft, but then that's a whole other story. Perhaps a can of worms we'll get into at another time. That's it from here at Milita Marine Corps headquarters in Garden City. Let's go back to Melba and Scott. All right. Thanks, Roma. In other news that we'll tell you about when we come back, one of the killers of Leah Green gives an apology and gets a stiff sentence. Two weeks ago, residents attending a public hearing on the plant complained bitterly about proposed improvements. Tonight, at a second hearing, some experts showed up. Roma Tori has a report. These Glencoe residents packed City Hall for a second public hearing this month on planned improvements to the town's incinerator. They got an earful from plant manager Steve Passage, ensuring that the stench emitted from the plant would be eliminated once improvements go into effect. The cost would be about two and a half million dollars. And just how much would be paid by taxpayers is a source of controversy, and it's going to arbitration. But residents here didn't seem as concerned about what comes out of their pockets as much as what's coming out of the incinerator stacks. This man demanded over and over to know if air quality tests had been performed. Can you tell us why an incinerator that's built in 84 doesn't have to have emissions tests for any reason. I mean, there's so many other things that do. We have tested the residue, I don't know, five to ten times for dioxin and have never been able to find any traces of dioxin in the ash. It's been about two years since air tests were performed, and this representative from the DEC said none could be done until after the planned improvements go into effect. Here is a stack test uh, that will be performed. Uh, Residents weren't happy with the answers, and some say they won't be satisfied until the plant is closed down. Glen Cove Mayor Donald DeRiggi assured them the city is exploring alternative waste disposal methods. Actually, to put an alternative plan into effect, in the event we do go that way, we're still talking 18 months to two years. Therefore, we have to proceed with the three implementations that Mr. Passage um, referred to. But for now, Glen Cove's incinerator remains a burning issue, one that'll remain in the air for years to come. In Glen Cove, I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. North Hampstead officials say they finally found the cause of the smell that has been hovering above their municipality, but now officials say it's a safety necessity but as Roma Torrey reports, some educators say seatbelts on a school bus are themselves a safety hazard. The Huntington school bus involved in a collision didn't have seatbelts, but one student said it wouldn't have made any difference. She, like many Long Island students, choose not to buckle up. One of the first questions they asked us when we got in the ambulance was, were you wearing a seatbelt? And I was like, no. <laughs> New York State has a law requiring that all school buses built after July of 1987 be equipped with seatbelts. But there is no law that says the seatbelts must be used. So here on Long Island, while many school buses have seatbelts, 
Well, under 10% of the districts require the students to actually buckle up. The fact is, it is the individual school district's decision in New York to institute a policy of seatbelt use. Most on Long Island choose not to mandate seatbelts. And according to this man, a former president of the State Association for Pupil Transportation, that's good news. We, as an organization, uh, would prefer not to have that mandate in effect because we feel, on top of the liability factor, that the seatbelt, type of seatbelt that there is today, the lap belt, uh, is dangerous to the child. In South Huntington, seatbelt use is urged, but not mandated. Officials say students choose to use the seatbelts more often as weapons than instruments of safety. For many of the youngsters, without having a monitor or someone on the bus that can actually supervise and see that they're using them, will tend to use the, uh, the belts as weapons. Uh, and that can uh, defeat the whole purpose of them. According to many Long Island transportation experts, school buses are safe enough without the seatbelt. Common uh, thinking is that if seatbelts are safe in automobiles, why not put them in school buses? Uh, there are a lot of different uh, reasons why they shouldn't be used in school buses because of the construction, the uh, manufactured uh, compartmentalization in a school bus that provides a safe environment for a child to ride on a school bus. So on Long Island, for many educators, the message to students seems clear. Buckle down on your studies, but you may not have to buckle up on the bus. I'm Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. And coming up next on the night edition, Roberto will be along with our forecast. And we'll tell you why Smithtown officials hope the state won't go back on a promise. Coming up... There's three men and a little lady, and they're all back to reprise their roles in the hit movie. Tom Selleck, Ted Danson, Steve Gutenberg, together again. Roma Torres, here with a review. Okay, Scott, well, I guess you can say the best way to enjoy three men and a little lady is to possess the mentality of its five-year-old star. Short of that, you may find some delights in watching three handsome, wealthy bachelors put their futures on hold to help raise the young child. But this premise is so far-fetched and silly, it makes Cheers, Magnum P.I., and Cocoon look like masterpiece theater. Despite its weak script and non-plot, Three Men and a Little Lady isn't terrible, especially if you like adorable little girls. Robin Wiseman plays Mary, the baby from the sequel five years later. She's a heartbreaker and is credited with keeping her three dads from marrying and most likely divorcing. So as they say, she saved them lots of money. But all good things must come to an end and Mary's mother decides it's time to settle down with a husband and start living like a normal family. So, who will be the lucky man? That's part of the suspense here. The rest of the film centers on Tom Selleck's inability to express his feelings. Lame stuff for sure. But if you can overlook the flaws, you may find something kind of innocent and sweet in all of this. We are building an office for 12,000 people. You can't put a bathroom on every other floor. Well, what if they don't go before they come to work? Oh, no! Oh, no, look! My foot must have grown last night. That's my shoe, silly. Thank God. Thought it was me. Mary, don't you like your oatmeal? It tastes like rubber. It's supposed to taste like rubber. What a crock. Hey, hey, hey where hey, did hey. you hear that expression? What a crock. Now, Danson and Selleck are the best of the adult leads, and there are some terrific offbeat performances by a fine ensemble of British players. But this sequel is too ponderous, and it fails to spark the enchantment of the original. Still, the little lady is a charmer, so I would say keep the baby, just throw out the bathwater. Phil? There's a lot of talk about some kind of ghost in the first uh, flick. What's that all well, about? Well, funny you should ask, Phil, because I have gotten so many phone calls about this so-called ghost, and I'm going to set it straight for everyone. Um, in the Three Men and a Baby film, there is a scene about two-thirds of the way through in which Ted Danson and his mother, played by Celeste Holm, are walking with the baby. But as they pass by a window, you may notice a figure behind the curtains. We have frozen it for you so you can see for yourself. Now, it appears to be a little boy, and a lot of people want to know, is this a ghost? Otherwise, what's it doing there? Well, according to Touchstone Publicity, the scene was not shot in a haunted Manhattan apartment, as some people insist. It was shot on a soundstage in Toronto, and the so-called ghost is a cardboard cutout of Ted Danson, which a prop person mistakenly left in the window. 
Now, it sounds hard to believe, but then later on in the film, the cutout is actually used, and there it is, this time up close and more personal. Now, we have compared both scenes so you can make your own decision. But ghost or no ghost, the story has certainly paid off for the movie company. Video stores are reporting the three men in a baby video is selling and renting like hotcakes. People are no doubt looking for that so-called ghost. Now, is it a publicity stunt? The movie company says no, but consider that just seconds before the first scene, that figure in the window is missing. So how did it suddenly get there so quickly? Touchstone couldn't explain, and if they are wondering about it, you can be sure they're doing it all the way to the bank. So we'll have to wait and see if there's a sequel or if there's a ghost in this one. We'll know it is a publicity I'll stunt. be watching okay. carefully. I yeah. bet. Thanks, Roma. <laughs> The holiday season should be a time of good feelings, but for the disabled, it may be a time to feel vulnerable to criminals. Yesterday at this hour, we told you about a disabled Elmont woman who was... Bill Zimmerman and the Night Edition on News 12. Oh, it's a rewarding day for Holy Family Elementary School in Hicksville today. Holy Family has received the Presidential Academic Excellence Award, and our education editor, Roma Tori, is standing by at the school for the celebration. Roma. Right, Carol and Lee, this may be one of the biggest days in the 30-year history of uh, the Holy Family School in Hicksville. It is uh, one of four on Long Island and one of 221 in the entire United States being cited for excellence by the U.S. Department of Education. And joining me now is Herbert Stupp. He is the Secretary's Deputy Regional Representative of the U.S. Department of Education, and also Sister Eileen McMahon, Principal of Holy Family. Congratulations to you. Mr. Stupp, why did you choose this school? Well, there's an outstanding overall learning environment in this school. As uh, Sister puts it, uh, and, and many people put it, it's more than a school, it's a way of life. Uh, the site visitors who came talked about the outstanding leadership of the principal, Sister Eileen, great learning environment, enrichment of courses. The, the kids uh, have great test scores and they're improving. So it's just for overall excellence, an outstanding school. Sister, you must be uh, very thrilled and proud. What do you think won it for you? I just think, as Mr. Stubb said, the overall environment of the school and the, and the cooperation of everyone. We work, the parents work with us, and naturally the teachers work. The community is very involved with the school, and we think we, that had a lot to do with our receiving this award. What's been the, the, the mood this entire week as you prepared for this big day? I don't think you have to say that. It's like the, the children are just about bouncing off the walls. We've kept them somewhat uh, calm, but everyone is very excited. Mr. Stupp, I, uh, I realize three of the four schools cited on Long Island are Catholic schools. Does this say anything about the public schools here, uh, or what is it about the, the Catholic schools that make them so superior? Well. New York State overall, it balances out a little bit, but certainly the vision of the uh, Catholic school principals that won is uh, outstanding, and they do a lot with uh, very little resources. Also, uh, they do what President Bush, Bush has urged uh, so many schools to do, and that is get parents involved, and that's the key to any successful school. All right, thank you. Thanks for both for joining us, and congratulations. Three, uh, the three other schools, let me just say them quickly, that were honored, Our Lady of Peace in Lynbrook, uh, Mauritius Elementary in Mauritius, and St. Agnes Cathedral in Rockville Center. So that's it from here. I'm Roma Torre in Hicksville. I should also note that as proof of the school's excellence, uh, our own Carol Silva, Carol, if you're listening, is uh -huh. an alumnus of the school. What is it, Carol? Uh, too many wraps on the knuckles? <laughs> uh, no, my knuckles are fine. I got general excellence when I graduated from that school. I was well behaved. When you went to Catholic school back then, you were. Roma, thanks a lot. Sure. Way back then, huh? Way back then. Congratulations, by the way. You must be pretty happy. It is ski season across upstate New York and New England. Just considering whether President Washington, the effects of the Persian Gulf crisis are hitting home. As News 12's Roma Torre reports, a company of Marine reservists from Amityville is the latest to be called to active duty. They're teachers, students, police officer, a mailman. But now they're all wearing the same uniform. They're Marines, and they just got the call. They're shipping out. It came at Thanksgiving Day. So my family was pretty upset. I was at a bar <laughs> in Oakdale, and I found out from another Marine in the unit who works in admin. He came up to me and told me, and I was, I was not too surprised. Was it hard to say goodbye? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely very hard, but it would be much better to say hello when we come back. I guess there was a little bit of disbelief at first, but then the 12 or so calls on my answering machine confirmed it. Uh, I don't know. It was disbelief, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Do you believe it now? Yeah. <laughs> This company of reservists from Amityville are communication specialists, and by Wednesday morning, they'll be in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, for more training. After that, they have no idea.
But whatever it is, they say they're prepared. They're hard chargers. Being in the reality of it, I think uh, all my Marines be motivated to do the very best they can. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really feel we'll have no problems. Once they got over the shock of getting the call to active duty, the overriding emotion for many of these men and women wasn't fear or anxiety or nervousness. Believe it or not, it's boredom. Just a lot of hurry up and wait, and as for being anxious, nervous, and scared, like, if you start worrying about tomorrow, you just bug yourself out. You might as well just take it as it comes. The mood is positive because they say they have so much support, not only from their families, but from the general public as well. well as long as we have the public support, that's what's so important. Uh, the public has been giving a lot of support to us, the armed forces, sending them gifts and all kinds of nice things. These are the few good men and women who've prepared so hard and long for this very moment. They have no idea what's ahead, but they say they take a lesson from some here who've served and joined up again. It goes with our motto, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. So uh, we are a unique breed, and, and it's like a family. I'm Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. Coming up next on the Night Edition, Roberto will be back. Another look at the forecast. And after a day of frustration, the Space Shuttle Columbia is back on track. Details coming up. If you thought you knew Suffolk OTB, think again. There's more excitement than ever before with top action simulcast live at 12 locations. And wait till you discover Suffolk OTB's own indoor clubhouse at the all-new Telerace and Hop Hog. Now enjoy live racing on 42 screens in two clean, comfortable theaters. Plus, you can treat yourself to fine dining and refreshing cocktails all under one roof. It's year-round excitement like never before. Rediscover Suffolk OTB. Now, more than ever, Suffolk OTB is the place to be. Heating costs are on the rise, and 90% of Long Island homes are still inadequately insulated. At J.C. Home Care Center, we'll help you fight rising energy costs by insulating your walls, attics, and crawl spaces. J.C. Home Care Insulation keeps you warm in the winter and cool in the summer, and our insulation even pays for itself with yearly energy savings of up to 40%. Call 756-5600, and our trained energy auditors will evaluate your home at no cost or obligation. So act now at J.C. Home Care. We really care about your home. Fact. As you grow older, your risk for heart disease increases. But facts can change. By the kind of research being done at St. Francis Hospital every day. You can help make your contribution to our Challenge 90 campaign. Call 562-6023 and help St. Francis meet the challenge. There was light, the age of discovery. There were flashes of brilliance, bold advancements. Advances in time. Now, out of the light comes the collection. Seiko's age of discovery. The past revisited. The past perfected. By the most advanced timekeeping technology on Earth. Seiko, the future of time. A brief look now at what else in the world is going on. The chairman of the U.S. Chiefs of Staff is in London discussing the Persian Gulf crisis with the new British leader. General Colin Powell was welcomed by British defense chiefs and the new prime minister, John Major. During talks, Powell is expected to repeat the Pentagon's view that diplomatic efforts have a slim chance of preventing war in the Gulf. While the general was visiting London, U.S. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney arrived in Warsaw. Poland may buy U.S. fighter bombers and other weapons. If the sales are permitted, Poland would apparently become the first Warsaw Pact country to buy arms from U.S. manufacturers. In Moscow, panic buying and food hoarding continue as Soviet citizens fear a winter famine. President Mikhail Gorbachev is responding to the crisis by boosting food imports and setting aside 12 million acres for individual farming. Meanwhile, emergency food supplies arrived from Germany today, and the European community is meeting in Brussels, preparing a multi-billion dollar aid package. Finally, a Soyuz space capsule docked with the Mir space station today. Going along for the ride is a Japanese journalist who will broadcast daily television and radio reports during his week-long stay. Toyohiro Akiyama is the first journalist and first Japanese citizen in space. His network paid the Soviets $12 million for his round-trip ticket to Mir.
Everything is back to normal on the Columbia Space Shuttle after a problem with a malfunctioning instrument. The shuttle's space observatory crew says a problem with the instrument pointing system is fixed. Astronauts have been doing the picture taking manually. NASA says about 10% of Columbia's planned experiments will have to be scrapped because of the problem. Houston Control confirms that all three star trackers now are working. Andrew Berto's back, and then a look at the weather. Things starting to get cold. Finally yeah. feeling like winter out there. $12 million to go up there for a ride like that? was the super saver he got. He yeah. could have gone to Action Park for $1.50. <laughs> Rolling Thunder. I don't know what he hopes to zap his way to a world championship and $10,000. News tells Roma Torrey has more. This is not how you play Nintendo. Now watch a real champ. I do my homework first before my Nintendo. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Dad's here. Is that why you're saying that? <laughs> That's true? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's sort of true. 14-year-old Eric Trinagel from Huntington is a whiz at the game. He's a state champ. Nintendo gives me most of my brain power. Yeah, that's, that's it, yeah. He's one of 90 people competing for the World Nintendo Championship in Los Angeles. That's 90 people out of more than half a million who started the competition. Three people will win in three age groups. Eric in the teenage category is probably going to have the stiffest competition. My best would be Tetris. Uh, I haven't met a friend yet who can beat me in it. People watch that uh, just like tell me like to turn it off because they get sick. But uh, that's how fast it is. I have a computer game that has surgery in it, and he spent all weekend doing surgery, and he's now learned to remove an appendix, so God knows. Eric's family, which doubles as a fan club, says they can't even come close to his level. There's no challenge to it for him. Mm -hmm. It's just one, two, three. Really? He's a machine. They say they have complete confidence he'll do well in California. As for me... How did I do the first time around? <laughs> not, not, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll keep my day job. In Huntington, I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. And if Eric wins the championship, in addition to winning $10,000, he'll also take home a big screen TV and a new car. What's he do with a car? <laughs> He's got to leave it in the garage for a while. <laughs> well, anyway, that's it for this hour. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Zimmerman. And I'm Colleen McVeigh. We leave you now with a look at Kenny Rogers' Christmas concert at Westbury I'll Music Fair. Home. Have a good night. Christmas. Island locations today, one group to celebrate, the other to debate. Education editor Roma Tori is here with that. Roma? Well, Melba, from time to time I come across education stories that happen to be unrelated, but seem to have some kind of unifying thread. Well, the two stories I'm spotlighting today might fall in the category of good education news, and it's all about students getting the recognition they deserve for learning their lessons well. <laughs> It's called a jubilant song, and these students at St. Agnes Cathedral Elementary School had every reason to be happy. The school is one of four on Long Island cited for excellence by the United States Department of Education. The award was officially presented in a ceremony in St. Agnes Cathedral in Rockville Center. Community leaders and clergy honored the school with awards and citations. Among them, Bishop McGann. To all who work supporting this tremendous effort in St. Agnes, congratulations. You've done a wonderful job. The educators were celebrating for another reason. Three out of four of the Long Island schools cited for excellence are diocesan. Adelphi may not be far from St. Agnes, but here the story couldn't be more different. High school students are gathering for the second annual National Issues Forum, and this year's topics are abortion and freedom of speech. But it's certainly better than having no system. If we look for a perfect system, we will not find one, and we will not just about all these students could agree on was that they disagree, and that, their advisors say, is okay. They're the top social studies students on Long Island, invited to debate the pros and cons of flag burning, rock and roll lyrics, and government deception. If you ban something, once you ban one amendment, this is going to go to the next one, and the next one, next one, you know, we're going to do it in the communist society. These high school students did manage to agree on one thing, though. Freedom of speech is an issue they say they can all celebrate, from Adelphi to Rockville Center and well beyond. Some future leaders there. The three other Long Island schools that won the Excellence Award are Holy Family in Hicksville, which we met last week, Our Lady of Peace in Lynbrook, and Mauritius Elementary in Mauritius. 
They are among just 221 in the entire nation to get the honor. So congratulations to them all. Mm -hmm. Yes, boy, Melba. what an honor yeah, that is. Huh? nice. Great. Well, it is that time of year now when a lot of us think about a winter getaway, have some fun in the sun and things like that. But consumer editor Julie Kessler is here to tell us now that along with the swim trunks, you should remember the... 12 Long Island Town Meeting, the economic future of Long Island. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> All right. Still ahead on News 12, we'll have some tips for you if you're a beginning skier. Mm -hmm. 1990, this may just be a good time to check out the movies you missed earlier in the year. Roma Tori is here now with a look at some of the top videos. Roma? Oh, Melba, it's got something for everyone. It is curious, though, to see how some movies that didn't do well on the big screen thrive on the small. That's true of some on our top ten list of top-selling videos for the week. Others, like Pretty Woman, still look good no matter what size the screen. Hey, what are you doing? Stop it! Open the damn door now! Do it! Stop or I'll shoot! Bringing up the rear of our list is Miami Blues, a red-hot action comedy thriller starring Alec Baldwin, Jennifer Jason Leigh, and Fred Ward. In the number nine position, Bird on a Wire, yeah, well, one of Goldie Hawn's comedies. But the big attraction in this one may have more to do with her co-star, Mel Gibson, and a side of him few have seen before. Number eight, an old film in a new form, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Now audiences can throw toilet paper and toss toast in the comfort of their own home. Number seven is Wild Orchid, a hot and steamy romance set in the tropics of Brazil. Mickey Rourke and Jacqueline Bissett star. Back on home soil, Glory, in the sixth position of top videos, details the heroic and heartbreaking story of the first black regiment to fight in the Civil War. It stars best supporting actor Denzel Washington and Matthew Broderick. Number five is Q&A, Sidney Lumet's dark drama about crooked cops hunting bad guys in a crooked city. Nick Nolte, Armando Santi, and Timothy Hutton star. Michael J. Fox is once again time-traveling in this latest sequel, Back to the Future Part 3. That's in fourth place. Number three is The Hunt for Red October. A submarine thriller starring Sean Connery and Alec Baldwin is obviously thrilling the home crowd. The Cinderella Story, Pretty Woman, starring Richard Gere and Julia Roberts, is still sitting pretty for the accountants. After cleaning up the box office, it's scoring big at home. You wouldn't hurt me. After all, we're married. Consider that a divorce. And Total Recall, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, has muscled its way to the top position. This science fiction thriller is the most watched movie video of the week. Well, that Arnold Schwarzenegger is pretty incredible, and uh, it's amazing what some muscles can do. You see, Scott, all you have to do is pump up a little bit, and you too can be a movie star. I'll tell you, the two of Don't you. Don't bring that topic up again. <laughs> all right, you got it from all sides. Then. Nah, all right. Let's move on. Huh? Some unkind cuts. Speaking of unkind <laughs> cuts, for New York, 6153. There may be nothing as painful as a parent having <laughs> ever to a child. That was the experience for one foster family in Sayville. Roma Tori is here with that story. Roma? Melba, once again, the foster care system comes under scrutiny for laws that seem cruel and heartless. Five-year-old Alicia had been living with her foster family in Sayville for the last three years. Today, she was taken away, and her foster parents have no choice but to say goodbye, wish her well, and hope they'll be allowed to see her again. I found a little tiny foot. For five-year-old Alicia, this is her family. She's lived in the Sayville home since the age of two when she was brought here in bandages, the victim of alleged abuse. She's come to know Victoria and Ron Miller as her mother and father, and their children as her brothers and sisters. But just as quickly as when she arrived, she's gone. The child is being returned to her biological mother in Brooklyn. I just hope that her mother will love her and she'll think twice this time about being with the man that abused her child. The Millers see themselves as another casualty of the foster care system. They intended to adopt Alicia, but under the law, only on the condition the biological mother agreed to terminate her rights to the child. That never happened, and after two years, she decided to take the child back. She once said to me, Mommy, why are you sending me away? And I said, I'm not sending you away. I love you very much, and we all love you. But it's just something she had to do. She had to go home to her natural mother, and I just hope, like I said, we can't see her again. Victoria Miller says she can't argue with the law, but she fears for Alicia's safety. The child was allegedly abused by her mother's boyfriend. 
They've since married, but he's reportedly moved to Poland. Miller says there's no proof he's left the country, and she's worried the couple will eventually reunite. Victoria and Ron Miller spent the last three years learning the joys of raising a child in the foster care program. Now they're feeling the heartache of losing that child to the same system. It's been an experience so painful, they say, they never want to live through it again. I can't say who she's better off with. I only hope that who she is with and who she ends up with will love her to the fullest. Mm -hmm. I spoke with the director of the foster care agency called St. Christopher Attili, and as far as Victoria Miller's concerns for Alicia's safety, he said he had sufficient proof through the services of a private investigator that the mother's husband was in fact living in Poland. And he told me if they have any suspicions at all that Alicia's mother plans to leave the country, they might be justified in pulling her passport. He told me Alicia will be monitored weekly and there will be surprise visits by social workers. And as for the Millers, they say they just want the system changed to guarantee the rights of foster parents uh, for regular visitation to, uh, with the children and, and uh, maintain their love for them. It's always Sounds difficult like for kids to understand. Very difficult. That little leash is going to be in for quite a hard time for the next mm -hmm. few days. But uh, what about the Millers? Is this really just turn them off of ever being foster parents again? They have another foster child who they hope to adopt eventually. Um, but they said this, as I mentioned, the experience was so painful, they doubt they could go through another separation and, and continue mm -hmm. in the foster care program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, In some other news now, North Hempstead Supervisor Ben Zwern is not used to winning a future success. But are, are, are our students being trained to fill the high-tech jobs of the next century? News 12's Roma Torrey looked for answers in part three of our Focus 12 series, Taking Stock, the Economic Future of Long Island. It's 11.30 on a Monday morning, and Eric Bells is leaving high school to go to work. Welcome to what many are calling the future of education. Schools and businesses working together to train students for jobs in the high-tech world of the future. If we're going to focus on the future, we have to focus in on what we're doing in schooling and try to expand the school doors and, and the building into the, into the job market, into, into the real-world setting. Many educators and business leaders complain schools fall far short of the mark when it comes to preparing students for the working world. They can no longer provide an education for a factory workforce that starts and ends with a whistle. So Bright Hut started the School Business Partnerships of Long Island to address the needs of business by working with schools. The East Meadow School District is partnered with Scales Air Compressors. It's Eric's first day on the job. I didn't want to sit around for the rest of my life pumping gas, but uh, I think that uh, this job is going to help me make a decision of what I want to do. At Scales, Eric's boss, Bob Guffey, echoes the complaints of hundreds of manufacturers on Long Island. They say they have jobs to offer young people, but most lack the mental and technical skills to do the work. There's been a, a large of, uh, response, but not of qualified people. Most of them haven't any work skills ap you know, applicable to this job. And according to Bright Hut, that's also the cry from countless personnel directors throughout the island. Regardless of where they come from, whether it's right out of high school or, or out of college, they still don't have the academic skills in many areas and the personal attributes necessary to hold a job with us. The focus in East Meadows Occupational Ed program offers a lot more than hands-on experience. With technology constantly changing and schools unable to afford the latest equipment, instructors here are stressing a brains-on approach, teaching adaptability and problem-solving techniques. Companies now are looking for kids that can learn. They're not looking for kids that come in and, and can spit back information. East Meadow schools, like many others on Long Island, are trying to adapt to the job demands of the future. They've eliminated shorthand here, for example, and greatly increased their computer courses. But even the most optimistic of educators say this kind of retooling may not be enough. And some are advocating a complete overhaul of Long Island's educational system. And I know superintendents of schools on the island who would say we really need a radical uh, restructuring of the schools from top to bottom. Is this the future of education? Inside the halls of the East Meadow School District and scaled air compressors, the answer is a resounding yes. Today's people who are coming to us who do have some other qualifications will take care of today's business. People such as Eric will help us take care of tomorrow's business. Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island.
Taking stock continues tomorrow with a look at a program which is helping homegrown... Story reports for us now they're demanding that the Water Authority clean up its act. This may look like a cocktail party, but it's unlikely these Bohemia residents are going to be doing any drinking. The glasses contain water that came out of their taps, but along with that water was sand and plenty of other things. The worst days were Thursday and Sunday. The water were actually coming out nearly black. Um, I, I had two inches of sand in my toilet bowl um, and just streams of sand running in the sinks and, for, and from out of the faucets. It all started last Thursday when workmen constructing two homes at the end of Mid Place hooked into the water main. They turned off the water that day, but reportedly only told one resident. Residents say they're angry because they had no warning, and it's been five days of no showers, no laundry, or washing dishes, and no resolution until this Thursday when the Suffolk County Water Authority promised to install a hydrant. But while we were doing our interviews, this district manager from the Water Authority happened to pay a visit. I heard you mention to the lady that about the iron in the water. Would you drink brown water if it came out of your faucet? I wouldn't drink brown water, but if you drink it inadvertently, it's not harmful. And as for the problem and inconvenience, he said he was just as surprised as the residents. Shouldn't you have been able to foresee that this no. problem would occur? No. It's, it's, how could you foresee something like that? No. All right, so what... Well, we've installed Maine all around in, in Oakdale, and we haven't had the problem. This is really the first major problem with Howard Rusty Water on, on Maine installations in 1990. So that's the solution. Under Perino's recommendation, the Water Authority is drilling a one-inch hole in the water main to flush out all the dirt and the rust. But this is Monday, and the problem started Thursday. Homeowners want to know why it took the Water Authority five days before cleaning up the water. The fact that we're here, does that have anything to do with, with why the man is digging now? No, I sort of like somebody called early this morning, and this started to develop early this morning. How much longer before the water turns clean? I hope 24 hours. I hope. I, I wouldn't bet anything on it, but I hope 24 hours. In Bohemia, I'm Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. The Water Authority apologizes for the problem and is offering to uh, pay residents for the inconvenience. They suggest that homeowners submit any bills they incurred since the problem began last week. A major sink is brewing over a multi-million dollar expansion of the Smithtown landfill. Smithtown and Huntington have been sharing the landfill as part of a joint agreement. But the facility may have to close next week unless the state grants it... 25 a years. Tomorrow the superstar celebrates his 75th birthday. And as Roma Torrey reports, one Long Islander is celebrating already. He's old Blue Eyes, the chairman of the board. But to this man, he's simply the best. Well, Sinatra, when he sings, is really a poet. Uh, it's his interpretation of a lyric that is that makes him so unique i think when he comes out on stage there's a, an intrigue a mystery you don't know what he's going to do it's like a champ coming into the ring so tell me why should it be true murray bergson could possibly be frank sinatra's number one fan in february he's donating ten thousand dollars to a sinatra charity golf tournament in palm springs just to be close to its host I'm happy that it's going to charity. I'm happy that I'm going to reap a, a benefit of meeting Sinatra, and uh, and hopefully I'd like to have my picture taken with him, and that would be one thrill, which I will blow up to post a size. Now that Sinatra's turning 75, Bergson's obsession has become infectious. He's managed to persuade his part-time employer, Bob Stanford, to decorate his Soundtracks record store in Huntington with Sinatra memorabilia. If you think about all the young girls that dressed up like Madonna, you can say, how can anybody just idolize someone this much? Well, Murray does that in the same way, and I just look at him and I go, I can't believe this. Buscamos la mesa. By day, Bergson's a Spanish teacher in Northport. His students say they never once heard him mention Senor Sinatra. But after school, Bergson retreats to a Sinatra wonderland, complete with three jukeboxes, hundreds of albums and CDs, and rare collector's items. Do you sing? Uh, I used to, and occasionally still do in the shower, or when I feel like. Do you sing along with uh, Frank? Uh, no, nobody sings with Frank. <laughs> this little town blues. Bergson said he first heard Sinatra 43 years ago, when he was 7 years old, and he became an instant fan. 
Since then, he's seen well over 20 concerts and cherishes the day back in the 1960s when he had his first close encounter with his idol. So I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, excuse me, Mr. Sinatra, I've been an admirer of yours for years. Could I please have your autograph? And he said, sure, would you like a drink? And I, I'm afraid I did a Ralph Cramden, and I did a humna, 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 and finally said, no, thank you. But uh, if the situation were reversed today and the same thing happened, I would say, no, thank you, Mr. Sinatra, let me buy you one. Call him an obsessed fan, a man who just likes to understand the words and songs, or a plain nut. Murray Bergson knows what he likes, and he plans to keep listening for a very long time. Frank, uh, may we all live to be 400 years old, and may the last voice we hear be yours. You make me feel so young. I'm Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. Sinatra continues to go strong. He'll go on a world consort tour next year. Well, the DA and the DA's office tells us tonight he will board up that abandoned building in downtown Bayshore tomorrow. No. Well, Scott, the trouble-plagued Hempstead School District just suffered another blow. Education editor Roma Torre is here with the report. Melba, just when it looked like things couldn't get any worse in Hempstead, the district's interim superintendent, Dr. Ulysses Bias, resigned. Bias came into the district in July, at a time when Hempstead was reevaluating itself and beginning to make positive changes. He replaced Joseph Wright, who'd been charged by the board with incompetence. But then, within a month, everything started to unravel. An asbestos removal project in the high school that was supposed to have been completed that summer went way over schedule. The opening of school was delayed two weeks, but then many angry parents continued to keep their children home, complaining about health hazards inside the school. Attendance plummeted, and finally the school board decided to close the high school for good. And then on October 17th, the school board began an emergency plan to move the high school students into the middle school. It seemed no one was happy, from students to their teachers and parents began to demand Bias's resignation. The district was also the subject of a state education department investigation, as well as a probe by the Nassau District Attorney's Office, looking into charges of financial mismanagement. Bias won't return our repeated phone calls, and neither will Sidney Johnson, the man appointed by the state education commissioner to assist and advise the district. Board President Susan Jordan declined to speak on camera, but told me the board wanted Bias to stay, calling him a very good administrator and superintendent. Now, as for the high school, about 150 ninth graders are now back in the high school building, but Jordan couldn't tell me how much longer before all the high school students can finally put the mess behind them and concentrate on their studies ahead. And it is something to consider that after the new superintendent uh, starts work uh, sometime in the middle of January, the Hempstead School District will have three, had three superintendents in one year. Well, it Cal sure hasn't been boy, easy for anybody. It hasn't. Well, mm -hmm. certainly some record uh, nobody could be happy about. Do we know who the new superintendent will be? No, the, uh, the Board of Education is meeting on Monday to make that decision. And, of course, it'll take some time before they, they uh, finally appoint somebody. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Roma. When the evening edition continues for you tonight, we're going to tell you about Long Island's best heart hospitals. And Roberto has the word. As business. Legislature has managed to restore several bus routes in the county slated to be eliminated because of budget constraints Saturday be restored. People who go to work, people who need a medical or saving to the company so the service will be there for all these people. Suffolk County will not be spending any public money under the agreement. But on the local school front, the news isn't good. The state legislature has cut $39 million out of Long Island's education aid, and the impact is expected to be severe. Some districts are being forced to dip into reserve funds, while others, such as Lindenhurst, have no spare money. And as education editor Roma Torre reports, administrators there have already begun to make some deep cuts. The Lindenhurst School District, like so many others on Long Island, is forced to make up hundreds of thousands of dollars in its budget that the state promised and is now taking away. Lindenhurst is losing almost a half million dollars, and already Superintendent Anthony Pecorelli says the administration has begun swinging the axe. We're talking about uh, cutting back at least three teachers and maybe as many as five or six. 
and that will be difficult, but uh, it will have to be done in order to uh, take up the $425,000. There's no question, he says, that education will suffer, and particularly for those students in special programs, such as gifted and talented and special ed. Uh, all those programs, uh, programs for uh, youth at risk, all those programs are going to come under greater scrutiny and possibly uh, could uh, feel uh, the knife when uh, it comes time to, uh, to formulate your budget. Just about every other county in New York State will lose less than 1% of its education aid. But compare that to Long Island's share of the burden. Suffolk schools will end up losing about 10% of their aid. Nassau schools more than 11.5%. Once again, Long Island schools get stuck with the biggest and most painful cuts. Nassau, Suffolk, and Westchester County are taking uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest hit. And it's, and it's largely due to uh, the inequities that are um, occurring because of the equalization rates. And he says now with an even dimmer fiscal forecast than initially predicted, he feels certain Long Island schools are due for a major overhaul. There's no question that there's going to have to be some sort of a restructuring, some sort of a, a revamping of the way education is provided and, and what school districts are going to give to their students. <laughs> It's a sad old refrain for Long Island schools, less aid today and even darker days ahead for students, school staff, as well as taxpayers. That's going to hurt because you, you're talking about um, what is really America's uh, investment in the future. Inland and Hearst, Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. Other cost-saving cuts in Lindenhurst include closing eight schools after hours, freezing jobs and overtime, and eliminating field trips and weekend activities. The U.S. Education Department is reversing its ban on minorities. This spring, state legislators will have to deal with an estimated $4 billion budget gap. Melbourne, Scott? No help from any quarter. No, and then they're going to look to Washington and probably get more Same cuts thing from there. there. Trickles down. Well, one of the state's budget casualties, 100 needy families who depend on a Port Washington center for everything from transportation to medical care. As education editor Roma Torrey reports now, today's Christmas party could very well be its last. Beneath the laughter and joy at this Christmas party is fear and sadness. Port Washington's 10-year-old outreach program for needy families has just been cut from the state budget. We have no dollars. <laughs> I mean, we have um, nothing coming in. Um, in fact, as of immediately. $23,000 is all it takes to run this program each year. So little money compared to other state budgetary expenses. And yet without it, parents say they'll lose so much. They teach us um, health and food safety, um, nutritional development, um, motor skills, development skills, language skills. There's just so much going on here. And um, without it, we, I, I could really just say I'd be lost. These are families that are sharing, that are uh, renting a room in someone else's apartment, an entire family living together in one room. They have no telephone, they have no car, they, uh, they have no way to get out, and if, if the program ends, they'll retreat. Many of the families here don't speak English and lack even the most basic knowledge to care for their children in this country. They have helped us, they like, you know, teach us how to um, defend ourselves you know, with people that try to take advantage of us because we are Spanish. Outreach workers say the program more than pays for itself by helping parents to go back to school and find jobs. If you really want to think in terms of hard dollars, what is this program doing in the short run to prevent, the, to allow people f to go out there and explore their own potential to get jobs and to avoid them maybe later on needing social services for so long. Volunteers at the center and its sponsor organization, the Parent Resource Center, are scrambling to scrape up at least $15,000 to keep the program alive. It won't be easy, they say, but then this is the Christmas season, a time to receive as well as give. We could use a miracle. In Port Washington, I'm Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. The search continues tonight for a missing New Hyde Park woman. It's been one week since... Tuition. ...to be asked to dig deeper. Tuition at that two-year college is expected to rise next semester. Education editor Roma Torrey has that story. Those in favor? Aye. In just three seconds, the Nassau Community College Board of Trustees approved overwhelmingly to increase tuition at the college by $200 a year. I don't think any one of us wants to see a tuition increase 
Uh, but I think those of us who are in favor of it at this time really feel that we have no alternative other than to be faced next year with cutting programs severely. And that's a much worse alternative. Nassau Community College is just another victim of a fiscal domino effect, with the state cutting the college's funds by more than a million dollars and the county taking away the school's $8 million surplus. That prompted the lone dissenting vote by Richard Kessel. And what we're doing here is uh, putting on the backs of the students the county's error in taking away our entire surplus rather than only a portion of it. But there was no argument from student leaders who supported the tuition hike. We're only paying 675 a semester and an extra hundred dollars I think most people can handle. Outside the boardroom on campus the reaction was quite different. Many students complained the new annual tuition of fifteen hundred fifty dollars a year is enough to force them to drop out. People like myself would have to work much harder to get what I got and if it's gonna just go up and up I'm in the future, I may not be able to come here. If they increase tuition $100, you're going to have a lot more people going other places. Those students who can't afford it and are eligible for financial aid, in fact, those who receive the maximum TAP award, will not be impacted at all. It's those students that fall below the maximum TAP award that may be impacted to some extent. College officials tell me the bills marked with the tuition increases are already being printed up, but they're still awaiting final approval from the county's Board of Supervisors, who will vote on January 3rd. I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. Unlike the SUNY hike, where the tuition increase goes into the state's general fund, the Nassau Community College tuition increase. The first two Godfathers in the 1970s won Oscars for Best Picture and earned millions of dollars in video sales. Entertainment editor Roma Torrey joins us now with a review. Okay, the moment we've all been waiting for, Scott and Melba. After the first two Godfather masterpieces, the big question now... Could writer Mario Puzo and director Francis Ford Coppola do it again? The answer is yes and no. Yes, because part three is visually perfect, shot in somber, dark tones. Yes, because the first-rate acting, headed by Al Pacino, Andy Garcia, and Diane Keaton, is beautifully reminiscent of the other two films. And yes, because the script by Puzo and Coppola is literate, epic, layered with interesting characters, historical references, even a touch of Shakespeare's King Lear, and captivating subplots. Don't ever again give that kind of order. Not while I'm alive. Understand? I command this family, right or wrong. It was not what I wanted! So why isn't this another masterpiece? Part 3 takes so much from its predecessors that it feels unoriginal and even at times becomes predictable. You anticipate the murders. Remember at the end of Part 1 when people get rubbed out against a backdrop of grand music and ceremony? That's here too. Even the stories are uncomfortably familiar. Michael, now the aging mob boss, is seeking honor and respect by getting out of the crime business. And he's trying to pass on the Corleone family mantle to a younger relative, just as Marlon Brando passed his power to Michael in Part 1. You almost get the feeling that Puzo and Coppola used up all their best ideas in the previous films and sadly resorted to repeating themselves. I did what I could, Gay, to protect all of you from the horrors of this world. But you became my horror. Happily, though, the magic and power is still there in spots, and if Puzo and Coppola did have to repeat the achievements of the past, it's hard to be critical of the sources. Godfather 1 and 2 are still among the best films ever made. They're my personal favorites. Godfather 3 does gain respectability, even though the signs of aging are very apparent. Melba? Scott? Uh, you yeah. still have to see the movie, right? You have to see yeah. it. You know, if you love good, gritty human drama, and this is 2 hours, 40 minutes, you're in there for the long haul. It's worth it. It's really you get a lot good. for your money. Get the, get the big <laughs> box of popcorn minutes, right? <laughs> before you sit down. All right. Hey, shortly, Santa's elves will be getting some competition. 18 students are soon graduating from the world's first major in toy making. Education editor Roma Torrey spoke with two of the students from Long Island, and she has this report. This isn't Toys R Us, and it's not Santa's workshop. It's a classroom, and these young women are cramming for final exams. They're working towards the world's first bachelor's degree in toy design. This program here 
is actually the first time that people are being trained in toy design specifically to become toy designers. So we'll see some things in the future that we haven't seen before. The program at the Fashion Institute of Technology in Manhattan is far from just fun and games. Although Amanda Van Holt of Baldwin and Susan McCoy of Jericho confess to feeling more like children than adults. I act like a child. I feel like a child sometimes, and I just feel like it's perfect. They work long, hard hours taking such courses as safety design, child psychology, and engineering. We have to learn just not just what makes a good toy. There's so much more to it than just something cute. Our teachers are so hard on us, and they want us to do so well. They're fr from the industry that they're nitpicking, and we have to do our best and change it, and we keep working. So we're up till 2, 3. Say hello to Squirmy the Inchworm and Shy Baby Bunny. Toys for under the tree? Wrong. They're prototypes or class projects. And as with most class projects, they were graded. Squirmy here got a B plus, Shy Baby Bunny an A. I'd rather got an A. <laughs> it's not easy to get an A in toy design. But just how does one explain making a career of trying to design the next Ninja Turtles or Cabbage Patch dolls? Friends would say, um, what major are you? I'd be a uh, toy designer. They're like, oh, like the movie Big. Play with all of this stuff. And then I go in and I tell them what I think. That's it? Yeah. And they pay you for that? Yeah. Suckers! Sue McCoy and Amanda Van Holt may very well be the next generation of suckers, but if that's what it means to design toys for a living, that's okay by them. I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. Mm -hmm. oh, what a job. I bet they've got a Cabbage Patch doll or a Ninja Turtle in them. In the wings, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. That's it for us this hour. Have a good weekend. I'm Elba Tolliver. Thanks for joining us. The holiday season opens next week. It's The Godfather Part 3. Entertainment editor Roma Torrey has a review. After creating the first two Godfather masterpieces, the big question now, could writer Mario Puzo and director Francis Ford Coppola do it again? The answer, yes and no. Yes, because part three is visually perfect, shot in somber, dark tones. Yes, because the first-rate acting, headed by Al Pacino, Andy Garcia, and Diane Keaton, is beautifully reminiscent of the other two films. And yes, because the script by Puzo and Coppola is literate, epic, layered with interesting characters, historical references, even a touch of Shakespeare's King Lear, and captivating subplots. Don't ever again give that kind of order. Not while I'm alive. Understand? I command this family, right or wrong. It was not what I wanted! So why isn't this another masterpiece? Part 3 takes so much from its predecessors that it feels unoriginal and even at times becomes predictable. You anticipate the murders. Remember at the end of Part 1 when people get rubbed out against a backdrop of grand music and ceremony? That's here, too. Even the stories are uncomfortably familiar. Michael, now the aging mob boss, is seeking honor and respect by getting out of the crime business. And he's trying to pass on the Corleone family mantle to a younger relative, just as Marlon Brando passed his power to Michael in part one. You almost get the feeling that Puzo and Coppola used up all their best ideas in the previous films and sadly resorted to repeating themselves. I did what I could, Kay, to protect all of you from the horrors of this world. But you became my horror. Happily, though, the magic and power is still there in spots. And if Puzo and Coppola did have to repeat the achievements of the past, it's hard to be critical of the sources. Godfathers 1 and 2 are still among the best films ever made. They're my personal favorites. Godfather 3 does... In your face. Back-to-back -back HBO originals to warm your night. Tonight. There it isn't. Now, as many of you are tuning up to sing Old Lang Syne tonight, what better time to look back at the year in entertainment? Here's Roma Tori with a look back. Right, Melba. Well, 1990 didn't look too different from the 80s, but the year did have its own unique personality. So here now is a look back at the arts highlights in 1990, our hits, flops, losses, and celebrations. Everywhere I turn, Tracy, Tracy, Tracy. You're under arrest. 
This was 1990's answer to the mega hit Batman, and so was this. And while they did score major points at the box office, who could have guessed a ghost, his lover, and a comedian would end up with the year's biggest blockbuster? Ghost, to date, has earned well over $200 million. Ghost was plenty hot this summer, and so was its ad campaign. 1990 was so full of sexually explicit films, a new rating was created to avoid the curse of the X. And so a little art film called Henry and June gave birth to the NC-17. Videos echoed the new openness. Madonna justified her love with this one, but not to MTV executives who refused to air it. In music, nothing seemed to compare to Irish singer Sinead O'Connor, who took home many of the big music honors. And on stage, Broadway had one of its best years for musicals. Among the openings, OK, a revival of the Gershwin show featuring a Long Islander, Merrick native Greg Burge. But as stars were being made, some of our brightest passed away. This was a year that saw the loss of such film greats as Ava Gardner, Barbara Stanwyck, Mr. Neff, 45 miles an hour. And the Swedish beauty who just wanted to be alone, Greta Garbo. Always be there for you. The legendary Sammy Davis Jr. lost his battle to throat cancer. And in the same week, Jim Henson, the wizard of Muppet fame, died of pneumonia. In October, the music world fell silent with the death of the legendary Leonard Bernstein. In the news, Roosevelt-born Eddie Murphy stole some headlines after being accused of stealing yet another script, this time Harlem Nights, which this Long Islander claims he actually wrote. And another native son, Billy Crystal of Long Beach, joined Robin Williams at Shea Stadium to promote Comic Relief 1990. Locally, the arts thrived with two of Long Island's best theater companies staying alive, despite some legal and financial woes. The Gateway Playhouse and Long Island Stage both had healthy seasons. And at SUNY Stony Brook, the International Summer Theater Festival featured Roland Gift, the lead singer of the group Fine Young Cannibals, who ate up the stage for Romeo and Juliet. And in the local film scene, making movies on Long Island remains as popular as ever, with independent features leading the way. Such homegrown products as Walking the Dog and Small Kill are hoping to put Long Island on the map by making big killings in 1991. Well, lots more movies are expected to begin shooting on Long Island next year, but ironically, the Suffolk County Film Commission, which is responsible for attracting many of those films to Long Island, is slated for the chopping block by the county legislature. Hmm. So we'll have to wait and see what kind of year shapes up. Have to find us on their own. Yep, on their own. They'll have to find us. Okay. Good luck to them. Thanks, Roma. President Bush is on the cover of Time magazine as man of the year, but with two faces. Time says Mr. Bush has some big financial problems. That was indeed the central issue throughout the year in education. And our education editor, Roma Toy, joins us now to take a look back, Roma. Right, Scott, it has been quite a year for Long Island schools, but nothing, many educators say, compared to what's coming up. Here now is a look back at a year that started with fears of a big bang at budget time, proceeded with a whimper, and ends with even greater fears that 1991 is the year Long Island schools indeed fail to make the grade. For educators, the year started with a math problem. Proposed cuts of about $14 million in education aid from the state, plus rising costs in school districts, added up to big budget troubles on Long Island, and that spelled disaster at many schools. We're going to have to cut programs sharply. We're going to decimate an educational program that's not only number one in the state of New York, but probably one of the best in the United States. Their concerns prompted trips to Albany, demanding more money for Long Island's high-tax, low-wealth districts. This year's state budget basically acts as if Long Island doesn't exist. But in the spring, just before budget elections, the state legislature found a solution. Lawmakers authorized taking money out of the teacher's retirement fund to make up for the shortfall in school aid. It's a loan that has to be repaid, and that's prompted criticism from many educators, warning 1991 will have to pay a steep price. Unless there's an upturn in our economy, we may see serious problems in meeting our educational needs next year. As expected, the solution did pay off in 1990. Most school budgets passed, and tax increases remained low at just about 4%. Still, the year did see austerity budgets, and with them, protests and complaints. 
Teachers in 22 districts at last count are still working without contracts, and that's taken a toll throughout the school communities. But nowhere on Long Island did education seem more troubled than in Hempstead. A nearly $2 million asbestos removal project in the high school over the summer was never completed, and so high school students were forced to crowd into the middle school while the high school was closed for cleanup. That school remains closed to most students. I think it's really terrible what they're doing because about the asbestos in the schools, they should have had it done in, over the summertime. You know, it's ridiculous what's going on in the school. That incident seemed to highlight a disastrous year for the district, combating community dissension, a state probe into charges of mismanagement, a DA's investigation alleging financial abuses, and the loss of two superintendents. But elsewhere, Long Island schools managed to celebrate during the year. Four elementary schools were among just 200 cited by the Department of Education as being the best in the nation. Long Island students made the list of 40 finalists in the prestigious Westinghouse Science Awards, and two Long Island colleges were considered among the best education bargains by Money Magazine. But money still promises to be a problem in most Long Island school districts in 1991. Already more cuts in education aid amounting to $190 million have come down from Albany. And SUNY tuitions are going up $300 a year. All of which has got educators fearing 1991 will fail miserably when schools are put to the fiscal test. Now, at last count, there are five Long Island districts on austerity, a number that is likely to multiply at budget time next year. And uh, as they say, folks, you ain't seen nothing yet. Mm. So hang on to your hats. People are hoping that they won't see anything worse than this past Yeah, well, they're year, talking huh? about if there's an upturn in the economy, mm -hmm. we might be all right. Certainly is no upturn. We're looking at a downturn in yeah. the economy. So they're expecting the worst. Not for at least the first six months. Yeah, yeah right. Thanks, Roma. All right. Now, whether you travel by train or car, it's been a tough year for Long Island commuters. Harold delayed Long Island Railroad riders, while construction on our roads delayed just about everyone. Well, roller skating rink in New Hyde Park has a new lease. Scott. Uh, it's Bill, I'm sorry. Okay, Greg, thanks. Well, Suffolk police say they've broken up a teenage burglary ring. And Suffolk police say a beauty school in Bayshore. High school opened its doors to staff members today, and it's expected to resume a regular schedule for students later this month. But as Education Editor Roma Torrey reports, some in the Hempstead community aren't convinced the school is safe enough to reopen. In October, Hempstead High School shut its doors to complete an asbestos removal project that should have been finished a month before. Amidst mounting community pressure and independent test results, the school was deemed unsafe, with a concern that dangerous asbestos fibers remained embedded in the carpets and inside classroom closets. Now the school is once again open, but only to staff members and some students. It was an order by Department of Education Commissioner Thomas Sobel. The State Commission of Health and the State Commission of Labor with their specialists uh, came in and made some 30 or more tests in various parts of the building. And as a result of those tests and other visual representation, have declared that the building is safe for reoccupancy as far as the asbestos removal project is concerned. Commissioner Sobel has also ordered that the school building be open to all high school students on or about January 14th. But the question remains, is that building safe enough? The commissioner wrote in his report that he's confident the air quality is well above acceptable standards. But that doesn't convince PTA president Tanya McDougald. We have not seen any uh, reports to indicate that would give us any, any indication that the school is in fact safe. As far as I'm concerned, we're back to September 1. Superintendent Ulysses Bias says the new opening date is set now for January 28th, giving the school plenty of time to clean up any excess debris. They ain't gonna have to finish by the 28th. The rugs are already down. You don't believe that they're gonna. I don't think. Make it I don't safe. think is. I don't think you're safe enough for us to go back to that school. That's my opinion. In September, Hempstead parents demonstrated in front of the high school, and most kept their sons and daughters out of the building. McDougald says unless she sees proof the building is safe, the community crusade, as she calls it, will return in full force. The students will, will not be um, well permitted to, uh, to enter the school until uh, we feel the community as well as the parents feel that it is, in fact, safe. In Hempstead, I'm Roma Torrey. News 12, Long Island. And up next, some sobering numbers on DWI arrests here on Long Island. All right, thank you, Joe. Well, the news is a little bit better in another 
uh, garbage-related story. The town of Islip made history once again with its garbage. This time, the news is good. Islip has just opened one of the largest publicly-owned recycling plants in the country. News 12's Roma Tori explains. <laughs> One, two, three. Yay. With just a flick of a switch, Islip's multi-purpose recycling plant is open for business. A facility town leaders hope will finally end an embarrassing saga that began almost four years ago with the infamous garbage barge. We've come from a municipality that was uh, in the process of having to ship half its garbage off Long Island to a municipality that uh, is totally contained, at least within Long Island, and 90% contained within the town of Islip. The town of Islip has done it again. It continues to lead the way in demonstrating to all Long Islanders that there is a better way to dispose of garbage than putting it into a dump. All of the waste is initially dumped right here, and as you can see, there's everything imaginable in these piles. Town officials say this is the largest facility of its kind in the entire country. The facility does all the sorting and separating so that residents can dispose all their waste into one can. Basically, we handle glass, tin cans, plastics, cardboard, and newspapers, and other paper products that come in with it. They all have markets. The glass has a market, the, uh, the tin and the metal ha has a market, and of course, we're part of the uh, Long Island Regional Cooperative for Paper, so all the paper that's generated here goes right into the cooperative. Jones says the $9 million plant will eventually pay for itself once other towns, such as Babylon, sign on. Babylon's going to explore whether it's economically advantageous for us to enter into an agreement with Islip. Because right now we're talking about building an enormous commercial recycling facility and we might tap into that or we might bring the recyclables here. Officials say the plant has the capacity to handle not just Islip's recyclable waste, but practically all of Suffolk County's 3,000 tons per week. That may be a few years down the road, but for now Islip leaders are hoping scenes like this will replace scenes like this so that the garbage barge will fade into little more than a foul memory. In Islip, I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. That's good. Spending plan. County legislature wanted, but as News 12's Roma Torrey reports for us now, the county... He told the crowd to keep the faith and not to despair. The state of Suffolk's budget crisis is finally settled, at least for now. The 1991 budget in place is the one the county legislature wanted. But as News 12's Roma Torre reports, the county executive says he's only lost the first round in a fight that has a long way to go. Both sides squared off in Suffolk County's budget battle, the county executive versus the legislature. And in the first round in court, the legislature won. Judge Marvin Goodman refused to grant a temporary restraining order preventing the firing of 52 county employees. And so the legislature's budget is in effect. But along with the decision is a new volley of accusations and counter-accusations. And it seemed just about all both sides could agree on was that they disagree. The legislature passed a budget that's at least $10 million out of balance. And we're uh, pursuing all of our legal options. At the same time, I'm involved in active negotiations with the presiding officer of the legislature, Don Blydenberg, to see if we can resolve this issue between us. It's this legislature which has delivered cuts and, and saved taxes over the last three years. And we've never had a problem with our budget. It's always been balanced by the end of the year. But besides charging the legislature's budget is unbalanced, Halpin is fighting the legislature's resolution to eliminate eliminate certain key departments, departments which Halpin says are not only essential, but save the county lots of money. Every other municipality around us is actually going to be strengthening their economic development efforts in order to attract new business and expand their tax base. Here in Suffolk County, the crazy legislature eliminated it. In fiscally constrained times, sometimes you have to cut somewhere. So our feeling was we, we survived without an office of economic development, without an office of emergency preparedness, uh, by putting real estate state functions back into different departments before we can do it now. But when it comes to money, some members of the legislature charge Halpin's use of a private law firm is costing taxpayers a lot. And while County Attorney Thomas Boyle admits the costs will be significant, he says the ends justify the means. The legal fees are, are something that we're all concerned about, but in terms of the overall picture of what's at stake in the litigation, uh, I think that it is in far excess of that. But regardless of which side eventually wins the budget battle, harder times are sure to follow. Last month, the county lost about $20 million in state aid that it was expecting, and that means a likelihood of plenty more cuts in county jobs and services. Very hard working under these conditions. We don't know if we're here today or gone tomorrow. In Hop Hog, I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island.
Both sides are expected to return to court in the morning where Halpin will appeal Judge Goodman's decision, but the big issue won't be settled. But it has recently won a big prize at the 1990 Cannes Film Festival. Here's Roma Torrey now with a review. Roma? Okay, Melva. Well, you know, it's nice to see that films like Hidden Agenda get made. It's a highly controversial political thriller that, like Missing, is based on fact. Now, just how much truth and reality is in there is no doubt subject to debate. But this harrowing story about corruption and violence in Northern Ireland is certainly worth seeing, if not for its shocking implications, then simply for being a riveting piece of filmmaking. It takes place in the early 80s. An American civil liberties type group is investigating charges of physical abuse against some Irish citizens by British police. One of the Americans is murdered, and that sets off a chain of events leading to cover-ups, deception, and more murder, traceable to as high as members of British Parliament. Are you going to do anything about this? Francis McDormand, who you may recall from Mississippi Burning and Dark Man, gives an exceptionally believable performance of an intelligent woman who's victimized by the very violence she's investigating. She leads a terrific cast of performers who may be unknown, but represent some of the best work ever seen on the screen. This is not a movie for everyone, and it makes some very bold charges in a somewhat unsensational manner. I also credit director Ken Loach for not copping out. The British may be depicted badly, but the Irish Republican Army isn't glorified either. I really only fault a weak ending in this one, but it is still bound to hit some raw nerves. I can't comment on its authenticity, but I do know a well-made film when I see one. Hmm. So enjoy it at the movie. Check it out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Roma. Back to the map now with a snowman, Roberto. Hmm. That's mm. what I am. Yeah, the old snowman <laughs> for tomorrow. <laughs> Tonight you are. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation begins tomorrow afternoon, probably. In Spokesman tonight for local health care is saying that Long Island hospitals are fiscally sick, and he told members of the Long Island Mid Suffolk Business Action Group that the financial crisis plaguing our hospitals is going to get worse. Here's more from News 12's Roma Torrey. Unfortunately, the hospital's financial condition is so severe today is that they hospitals are unable to pay their bills. Robert Lord, the executive vice president of Nassau Suffolk Hospital Council, speaks for 22 Long Island hospitals. He said our health care facilities are among the worst casualties of the state's weakening economy. And between rising costs and dwindling support at the government level, he says Long Island's hospitals are becoming incurably ill. Patient care suffers means patient safety isn't what it should be. If it is not already in crisis, it's fast approaching crisis. There. Richard Greenfield, president of Syosset Community Hospital, says they're continually losing money. And like so many other Long Island hospitals, they're suffering chronic shortages in personnel. With uh, insufficient reimbursement rates that are given to hospitals throughout the state and on Long Island as well, we become more or less uh, in a position of being non-competitive and we can't buy the help we need. And they say hospitals' economic woes have taken their toll on patients, with occupancy rates in hospitals well above 90 percent. At this moment in time, we have no beds. We have no medical surgical beds. Compounding Long Island's health care ills is AIDS. Lord says Long Island has the largest non-urban AIDS population in the country. And for hospitals such as Syosset Community here, the cost to care for AIDS patients is staggering. He says the disease should be treated as a national disaster. When it comes to AIDS, and 60% of all AIDS care in this country comes out of New York State, who takes care of that problem? New Yorkers take care of that problem. The state can't keep picking the hospitals as, as, as a target for saving money. But if they continue, I think the prognosis is poor for hospitals on Long Island and I guess throughout New York. Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. And Roma says the state's poor fiscal health has brought bad news tonight for 195 Long Island mental health workers. As part of the legislature's big and dollar budget cuts, the workers at four Long Island psychiatric centers are being laid off. The majority of layoffs are coming from Kings Park and Central Islip psychiatric centers. Some employees at Pilgrim Strait and Stagamore Children's Psychiatric Center are also losing their jobs. They're among a total of about 1,300 mental health workers statewide who receive pink slips today. Still ahead. Ed Will and Gus off News 12, Long Island.
And if war does break out, U.S. forces are going to rely heavily on veterans' hospitals to care for the injured. The Northport VA Hospital is one of 22 on the East Coast that is preparing for the worst. News 12's Roma Torrey spent the day there, and she filed this report. The beds are mostly empty now in the emergency treatment area at the Northport VA Hospital. But if a war breaks out, the staff says they're prepared. We've put a lot of time into it. It's preparing uh, what kinds of programs we may need to offer, what kinds of services we may need to offer that we're not offering now. What we've been doing now is looking at the types or the, the range of casualties that we would receive, and not only the, uh, the victim of traumatic stress, but also the victim of chemical agents, ballistic wounds, and infectious diseases that are common to the Middle East. Several of them have gone to special seminars out of state to learn just what to expect if casualties do arrive. Because of our uh, location to um, military bases here, Stewart Air Force Base in Poughkeepsie, and McGuire in New Jersey specifically, it's quite likely that we would see casualties coming in. The last time Northport saw war victims was Vietnam, but in the last 20 years, workers here say a lot has changed in terms of physical as well as psychological treatment. And this time they say they're preparing for a relatively new type of frontline casualty, women. We've never had uh, vast numbers of women who've had acute combat casualties. And if something uh, happens in Iraq today, uh, the possibility of having numerous uh, women with severe acute combat casualties is very real. They're also preparing for large numbers of casualties, in part, they say, because of the types of chemical and biological weapons expected to be used. The thing that's new is the chemical warfare is uh, very frightening, and the uh, rate of uh, people that might be dying from this is very high. Unless they have the protective suits on, uh, they're not going to survive. On a positive front, hospital workers say the out pouring of support for the troops now in this country could be tremendously therapeutic later on. And of course, the five chaplains based at the Northport VA Hospital plan to work overtime in the next weeks and months to keep the spiritual therapy in constant supply. It's up to chaplain service to try first and foremost to keep a spirit of hope. In Northport, I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. In World War II, the military had about half a million hospital beds to this report. Attention all residents. The Nassau County Department of Health advises not to drink the water. The word in East Massapequa and West Amityville is don't drink the water, don't even touch it. And 7th Precinct officers wasted no time in getting the message out. We are telling the residents in the area not to use their water at all. That includes any kind of washing, any kind of drinking. The uh, Nassau County Board of Health has uh, several inspectors going out testing the water now. We have a command post established here in Sears and they're notifying us uh, the areas that they check and we're opening that area. The health department reports that eight people in East Massapequa complained of water-related problems, and two landed in the hospital, suffering from skin irritations and burning sensations. And what the health department discovered was high pH levels, or high concentrations of sodium hydroxide. Basically, if you're going to have it externally, it's going to irritate the skin, possibly even burn the skin. If you swallow it, it can cause internal irritation. Domash says the health department recorded pH levels as high as 12. Normal readings range from 7.5 to 8.5. She says the New York Water Service, a private company that supplies water to the area, received complaints too, but failed to notify the health department. By law, normally, the water company is supposed to notify us. We were not notified by the water company, which will mean we'll be investigating that as soon as we get the situation under control. As of Tuesday evening, the affected area is East Massapequa and West Amityville, bordered by Cartwright Boulevard on the west, Sunrise Highway on the north, Merrick Road on the south, and the county line on the east. That area includes a shopping center and the Massapequa High School. Like, no one knows if we can drink at our house or not, because they said in the Massapequa area, but yeah. no one really knows, I don't you know? know what that means. I wasn't sure exactly what it was, if, if it was related to uh, Arabia or Iraq, and uh, so I decided I'd be better off not drinking water out of the faucet. In East Massapequa, I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. Now, the district manager of New York Water Service told Roma that the problem has been traced to a malfunction in their Massapequa pump station. 
He also said that his office had received six complaints, but when workers checked the water in the area, they recorded pH levels only as high as nine. And therefore, he said it was not necessary to contact the health department. He also advises residents who haven't been home today to let their taps run for a few minutes, even if the water problems are over. All right, time to check with Roberta now in the weather, and what a day it was. Mm, did, what did a day like, it was. Uh, it was if nice. you like spring-like weather. Well, mm -hmm. She said it, right? Yeah. And looking for answers. News 12's Matt Jablo is in Dix Hills this morning with one group of Jewish leaders. As a scored an accidental butt and the uh, fight is stopped after three rounds it goes to the scorecards Carlos Cruz a bloody mess but trying to pull it out with an aggressive tenth round I was talking earlier Al about Negron being able to bend over in the waist and what he's doing he's bending over and when he does Cruz is right there now Cruz is putting more pressure on Negron desperationly trying to get him getting him get him out of there Come in, come in. Mm. Tenth round action, and uh, it is scheduled for 12. In the earlier rounds of the final bell, these two fighters passing one another to get to their respective corners, refusing to touch gloves, and they haven't gotten any friendlier as this fight has gone on. And now the referee, Victor Draculich, takes Cruz back into the corner with the doctor. I think the ball now, if, 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 if Draculich claims that there wasn't even a butt or didn't see it, then the fight would be stopped on cuts and awarded to Negron. There's John Rivera again in the corner urging on Cruz to try to end it right now. Don't let the doctor stop this fight. Normally what they will do is give the corner man one round between rounds to work on it to see if he can stop the bleeding. Now blood from the cut over the left eye as well as the cut from the right eye. Boy, John Rivera in the corner of Carlos Cruz. Some tense moments over there. And now a rest in the closing seconds of the tenth and Cruz now looking to get back into the corner and come back fast to start the eleventh. And here you're really confused as a fighter. You don't know whether you need to go out and just try to take him out or get back to your corner so the corner can fix that cut. I would think though that Cruz has to has to go out and try for the knockout. He's way behind on my scorecard. It's like a pit stop at Indianapolis in the corner for Jeff Promotion, John Rivera, trying to do as much as they can do. Carlos, está esperando mucho. Ya no, ya no hay tiempo de chingarnos. Nos tenemos que agarrar. Ya lo trae bien cortado, okay? Tenemos que agarrarlo. John Eleven. Mire. And little else but the events overseas. Education editor Romatori has a report on student reaction to the war. Their bodies are at school, but their hearts and minds are on the war and hopes of peace. And with the approval of their principal, these Massapequa High School students spent free periods getting their message across. We're supporting the troops that are in Kuwait. We want them to come home as quickly and safely as possible. This may look like a thousand other demonstrations going on across the nation, but the students here at Massapequa High School wanted to make it very clear they're here to support the president's decision to go to war against Saddam Hussein. Instead of doing what the other protesters do and like totally, you know, country. spitting on our country, burning our flag, we'll go out there and show them that we do support the soldiers and that we're there. If I get drafted, which I'll be 18 in August, which I hopefully I won't, but if I do, I'll go over there to support my country because Saddam has to be stopped. And while Massapequa students were mostly united on their opinions of the war, those at Sachem were not. 
Some walked out of school without permission to protest, while others argued a different position. Well, my personal opinion doesn't agree with theirs. I don't think that we're there for oil. I agree with the president and the United States president in the Gulf. I support their right to dissent, but I don't think they're doing it the correct way. There are about 20 kids, and I don't think they're that interested in the war right now. I think they're a little more interested in getting out of class. And at Murphy Junior High School in Stony Brook, the release of tensions came in the form of discussion. Principal Arnie Dodge gave students a platform to question, argue, or just express their fears. They said that from Iraq can't bomb New York. Why can't they bomb us? We shouldn't have not even gone in to like help them in the first place. We should have like let them solve it themselves. If we wait any longer, he's either get stronger or try and take out the like Israel or other nations. And so I feel that we should try and stop them now. But no matter what their individual opinions, students throughout this country will continue to speak their minds. It's a freedom they're learning sometimes carries a high and often painful price. I'm Roma Torre, News 12, Long Island. Coming up next on the night edition, Roberto will return with his extended forecast. And can Kind of gave him a second win, intensifying his effort to try to take Negron out. And this is the concentration level of these boxers. He doesn't realize that he's winded. You're not thinking about going the 12 rounds. You're worried about those cuts. But you got to worry about knocking your opponent out. Oh, difficult position for Carlos Cruz. I've been there. I know. where amidst their prayers for peace, many of their relatives in the Middle East are hearing a call to arms. News 12's Roma Tori went to the Islamic Center of Long Island in Westbury. There are Muslims from all over Long Island, and they've come to the Islamic Center in Westbury to pray for peace. War or aggression or fight uh, is no way the solution for peace. Muhammad Shamshir Ali is their spiritual leader, or Imam, and he says he condemns all acts of aggression, whether they come from Iraq or the United States. I'm not going to take any side. As long as the aggression is there, war is there, negative elements are there. The Imam wanted to make it very clear to me that not all the Muslims who worship here are Arab. In fact, most are not. So while they're united in their religion, they're divided in their politics. This man is from Kuwait, with family still there. For him, the war brings relief and yet mixed feelings. Well, I uh, support our president, President Bush. I think uh, he's doing a great job. Um, as long as uh, he's putting order in the whole world, I support that. But for this Egyptian, whose family is still in Egypt, there are no mixed feelings. His sympathies are squarely behind Iraq and Saddam Hussein. What do you think about our presence overseas? Uh, I believe they, ha they are there for no cause except the aggression. Wouldn't you call it aggression that a, a, a man, Saddam Hussein, has marched into Kuwait and perhaps if he's not stopped would march into Saudi Arabia and then uh, elsewhere? Yes, I support him even marching to Egypt, my country, if he's going to repossess the Arab assets from the American hands. And yet for others who want Hussein stopped, the fighting overseas brings with it a spiritual conflict. Their hearts want peace while their minds see war. It's very confusing because since Muslims are fighting with yeah. Muslims and uh, it's very hard to take sides and uh, I think every Muslim is hurt. In Westbury, I'm Roma Tori, News 12, Long Island. And coming up for you next, other news from the island. We'll have an update for you on the Port Washington landfill problem. Please, don't tell you know who. The King's birthday is being celebrated on Monday and to mark that occasion, the new community cinema in Huntington is featuring an award-winning movie. It stars Danny Glover and it's called To Sleep With Anger. Here's Roma Tori with a review. Okay, Melba, I'm, I'm going to start with a negative, but it, it's all positive from there. One of the most unfortunate characteristics of Hollywood films these days is that they don't often require you to think. They're plenty entertaining, but most of the time when the credits come up at the end, the film flies right out of your mind and you're on to other business. Well, that is why Charles Burnett's film, To Sleep With Anger, seems so remarkable. It is a Hollywood movie featuring a Hollywood star 
that happens to be both entertaining and deeply thoughtful at the same time. Here. Susie. Is that you? <laughs> when Danny Glover arrives in a California <laughs> suburb one day to visit his old hometown friends from the South, their lives take a dramatic turn. He seems friendly enough, but all of a sudden the family is at each other's throats. Brother fighting brother, father against son. Glover somehow sparks deep-seated conflicts in this black suburban family, a family that's simply been trying to blend in. On one level, this is a story about the dilemma that faces so many other culturally and ethnically strong families in this country, materialism versus spirituality, togetherness versus ego. This is my youngest son's child. Oh, he kind of favor one of my boys when he's about his age. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that's bad luck to touch a fellow with a broom. And yet there are other levels. Glover represents a kind of evil presence. He's manipulative and devious and practices a form of black magic. It's a wonderfully creative performance, one that puts Danny Glover in a class with our finest actors. And he leads a terrific ensemble of relatively unknown performers who deserve bigger spotlights in the future. <laughs> Now, To Sleep With Anger doesn't have a lot of action, but it does make you think. And let's just hope Charles Burnett, the writer-director of this fine work, gets more opportunities to put his wonderful brain to work and give us lots more films in the future. So you sleep with mm. anger, but you wake to this film with joy. Danny Glover just has a winning personality, just exudes. Well, he finally the... got a serious role that he could yeah. sink his teeth into, and he showed off. Yeah, okay. It's good. good. Thanks, yeah. Roma. Roberto, tough act to follow. Ah, uh, yes, I know, but I must do something, right? Yeah. Well, why not? We'll have actually quite a lovely day for tomorrow. We have uh, actually more... It's quite political. I think that... ...people said you love to play. There's look to many things to be entertained, including buying lottery tickets. That is, according to a News 12 Hofstra poll. Entertainment editor Roma Torrey has more. If you like to gamble, chances are you place your money on the lottery. Half of those surveyed said they buy lottery tickets. Lotto. Have you won? No. <laughs> <laughs> you, will you continue to keep playing? Yes. Same with me, the lotto, but never won. <laughs> you going to continue playing? Oh, sure. 33% responded they don't gamble at all. I don't buy no lottery tickets. Okay. And I don't buy, uh, Fort Perry. I don't gamble. Okay. I never did. As for the rest of Long Islanders who like to gamble, the preferences ranged from 16% who say they go to casinos, 13% who participate in office pools, and 8% who like the horses and card games. Casino, state lottery, and office pools. Did you win any? No. <laughs> Not everyone likes to gamble, but everyone in our survey said they have a favorite type of entertainment. The single most popular choice is the movies. 25% said that's their favorite pastime. Some movies. What kind of movies? Uh, clean ones. The next most popular choice for entertainment is sporting events at 20%. My favorite type of entertainment is definitely sporting events. What New kind? York sporting events. New York Giants. Giants in 90. That's us, 91. Super Bowl. Golf. Sporting events. And then the choices ranged from concerts and theater at 18% each to 9% who chose museums and art shows. My favorite type of entertainment is museums and art shows. My favorite is a theater. But among young people, the breakdown was quite different. For them, the most popular choice was clearly concerts, 31% followed by movies with 29%, sporting events at 22%, museums 13%, and dead last among the under 30 crowd is theater. Nassau Coliseum, some of the truck poles and stuff like that. And my wife's gonna have a baby in one more day. So much for his outdoor entertainment. I'm Roma Torrey, News 12, Long Island. And that poll by Dr. L Elaine Sherman of Hofstra's Business School has a 5% margin of error, plus or minus. Well, there is lotto fever and there is Super Bowl fever, <laughs> Bob Wolf. Mm -hmm. Super Bowl.